Thank you.
Well, welcome back to Logos, everyone. I can't tell you how good it feels to be with you, even if it's just virtually, and here I am in an empty room. It feels great to be back together with you. It gives you so much joy and comfort. Can't you tell that I've got all the feels going on right now? We are delighted to gather once again in Logos for worship with you. So as long as we are gathering for worship virtually, as long as we're meeting with you in your living rooms We want you to stay engaged with us. We want you to stay engaged with us. So if you would, please utilize that chat feature on Facebook. When you gather for worship a little before 11 o'clock, say hi to folks. Greet one another. Drop a comment in the comment section or send us a private message. Let us know what God is doing, what he's revealing to you as we worship. But we want you to stay engaged. God's expectation for all of us is not to be passive. Now, I know that you're sitting on your couch, and that's really hard to do, but let me encourage you to stay connected, stay engaged in worship, your mind and your heart responding to worshiping together, even if it's just you in your living room with family. You might even be by yourself or with a roommate. Stay connected, stay engaged. Let's not be passive during this season. But as we normally do, we're going to start things off with Reading the Word of God, our call to worship this morning is Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been His counselor or who has given a gift to Him that He might be repaid? For from Him and through Him And to him are all things, to him be glory forever. Amen. Logos family, so glad that you're here. We're going to worship this morning through music and prayer, and it's going to be just a great time. We find ourselves after Easter, and the beautiful thing is, it's not the end of Easter. The church calendar actually goes all the way through Pentecost, 50 days later, celebrating an Easter tide, and we celebrate every time we gather, and every day, really, that our Lord is risen. So get up off your feet at your house. Let's sing together. Let's praise the Lord. Let's be the church all over the city. Let's declare what He has done.
It's our story. Let's sing it out tonight. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name,
together we declare together the grace of our God man Lagos family it's a joy even to be able to utilize technology and through a screen still be able to worship you. as we do so we want to find ways that that you are contributing to the worship you're not just consuming you're not just watching through a screen but you're actually participating so I hope you're singing out but we're also going to have a response uh, responsive reading this morning. So would you read this bold and underlined portion with us? Let's read. Praise be to you, O God the Father. You created all things by your power and your wisdom and so loved the world that you gave your Son to be our Savior. Praise be to you, O God the Son. You became human like us in all things, but lived without sin. You died for our offenses, and you rose again for our justification. Praise be to you, O God, the Holy Spirit. You lead us into all truth and spread the love of God in our hearts. Holy God, we often mold you into something less than you are, and we doubt your love and power in our lives. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to see you and to know you more fully. Fill us with the vision of your glory, that we may always serve you, praise you, and proclaim what you have done. Amen. i 
Now, kiddos, normally at this time, I would be meeting with you right there, but we can't during this season. You're in your living room, and I'm here, but we want you to know 
that you absolutely matter to us. And you matter to us because you matter to Jesus. Jesus really cares for you. He wants you to know him and to love him and to follow him. And so we are so delighted that we get to help you know and follow Jesus during our times of worship. So we're glad that you're there in your living room worshiping with us. And we want you to stay engaged too. We want you to be a part of worship and know that God wants you to know him and follow him every day of your life. And so one of the ways that we did that this week is that we asked you to look at a picture and then give us a response to what you think about that picture. Now, the picture that we asked you to look at is a picture that an artist drew in the 17th century of the creatures in Daniel's vision from Daniel chapter 7. Now, again, it was made in the 17th century, and you can kind of tell by the buildings that are in it and how the ships look out in the sea. But the artist really wants to try to capture what those creatures looked like. And I asked you to tell me what you thought, and this is what you said. What do you think about those creatures I showed you? Well, they kind of look weird and unusual because there's like a lion. It's like a lion with like so much fur and like a peacock fur on its head and like it's a four-headed peacock. It's a four-headed and I can see that it's probably a four-headed peacock cheetah. And My goodness. Michaela, what did you think about those creatures? Um, I wish that um, Dino had um a creature game that is a peacock with um butterfly with the bug and a little bit of eating cookies. <laughs> okay, ready? I need y'all to tell me what you think about this picture. So take it. What do y'all think? I like it. What do you think about those things on the side there? It looks so mystical. mystical? And I like Mabuyo. I like yeah. mystical things. Nice. Artist, what do you think? He thinks it's wonderful. Well, I certainly would agree that those four beasts are pretty odd looking and weird and kind of scary. But this is what I want you to know is that God has revealed these things to Daniel. And the good news for us is, and for you, is that God wants us to know who he is and what he's doing. And that's the beauty of God's word, is that God has given us his word to your mom and dad and to us so that we can know God and know what he is doing. I think that's pretty cool that we have a God like that. Hope you feel the same way too. But let me encourage you. So if you were to draw a picture of your own of one of these beasts or all of the beasts or of Daniel, what would it look like? And so if you could do that, even now during the sermon, you can draw a picture or at another time, but we'd love to see what you draw. So if you could post that, have your mom and dad post that on our, our Logos Facebook page or they can email it to me we might just show them next Sunday morning. So we hope to see those pictures that you draw uh, next week. All right. If you are new with us today, if you are jumping on and gathering with us virtually with worship for the first time, or maybe the second or third time, let me first say thank you so much for doing that. We know that there are so many awesome virtual opportunities for you to engage every day and every week um, to learn more about God and what he's doing, to be encouraged. And so we're honored that you would choose us. If, but if you could also honor us um, by letting us know that you're here, if you could go to the link that's on your screen and fill out that Connect Here card, that virtual Connect Here card, uh, we would just love to know that you have been with us. Now, normally we would shake hands and have a conversation either before or after our time of worship. We can't do that, of course, but our promise is if, if we receive your information, um, I will reach out to you this week because I'd love to see how you're doing and how we can best serve you in these very, very interesting days. So once again, thank you for joining us if you're brand new here. We are in the book of Daniel. 
In particular, we're in Daniel chapter 7, and this is a big turning point for us in the book of Daniel because although we've seen hints of it before in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7 begins what we call apocalyptic literature. It's all of Daniel's visions from this point on, most for the most part, and all of those visions have to do with what God is doing. So what is apocalyptic literature? Uh, apocalyptic literature um, is a, a genre of literature that has the intent to paint a picture of what God is doing in the midst of all the chaos of human history as He brings human history to a close, human history as we know it. And so that literature, apocalyptic literature, hopes to paint a uh, a picture of what God is doing and how he wraps up all of human history. That's its aim. And that's Daniel chapter 7. That's the heart of Daniel chapter 7. Now, um, much like many of you uh, and many of your families, you have started doing puzzles again uh, because we're looking for new ways, not just to entertain ourselves while we're at home, um, but because we want to do something more engaging to stimulate our minds, so we're doing puzzles. So my family is doing puzzles. And what is a puzzle? A puzzle is a picture uh, that has been put on a, a type of material that then has been chopped up into interesting, much smaller pieces. And the purpose of a puzzle is for you to take that jumbled mess of puzzle pieces and fit them back together so that you re can recreate the original image. Obviously, you know what I'm talking about. But if you have a puzzle, it came in a box, and there was a lid to that box, and on the lid to that box is a picture, and that picture is an image of the original picture that, what, that when you put all the pieces back together, that's exactly what it ought to look like. And so the top of the box is that overall picture and acts as a guide for you in the midst of you putting those pieces back together. You constantly go back and look at that lid, that image, to know how things are shaping up and for, for it to be a guide for you along the way. And that's exactly what apoc apocalyptic literature does for us. It paints that kind of picture for us, an overall view of what things ought to look like and what things will look like. Now, if you notice on the lid of that puzzle box, it doesn't have the details of how each puzzle piece looks, how each shape of the puzzle piece, all of that. There are no lines of the puzzle pieces. There are no details like that, just the overall picture. And again, that's the whole point of apocalyptic literature. That's the point of Daniel chapter 7. So what is the picture for us in Daniel chapter 7? What's the picture of his vision? What does God want us to know about what he is doing? Now, the picture we just had up on the screen, uh, should be up there now as well, is that 17th century picture, and it captures a lot, right? It captures the wind, the sea, and the four beasts. But let's go to Daniel chapter 7, beginning in verse 2. It reads this, Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. Now, the ancient Hebrew mind, when they would see the words sea, they would automatically paint that picture in their mind, but when they thought of sea, they thought of a mysterious, turbulent, uncontrollable, chaotic environment. Um, they couldn't control the sea. It was mysterious. It was dark, and they couldn't see underneath it, and so it represented universal chaos, and we certainly can relate to that, and Daniel could too. I mean, Daniel was whisked away as a, as a young man from his home and nation, thrust into a new culture, grew up that, in that he saw the devastation of growing empires and what they did to their enemies. He understood the turbulence of universal chaos. And we certainly can identify with that too, can't we? We certainly can feel like, especially these days, that we live in the midst of a sea of turbulent chaos. At any moment, going to unravel 
uncontrollably. And that's, that's what the Hebrew mind would have saw when they considered the winds stirring up the great sea and these four great beasts coming out of the sea. And so what do we have? In this vision, we have four beasts, one right after the other. And the next one more terrifying than the first one. Um, and then on the fourth beast, we have a beast that has ten horns on its head with one horn that emerges among the others that becomes more powerful, more boastful than all the others. So we have four beasts and we have ten horns with one little horn doing crazy stuff. And to add to that vision, then we have two heavenly scenes in chapter 7. One of the Ancient of Days and then one of one like a son of man. Now, we'll get to more of that in a moment. But what are we to do with the four beasts and the horns and the one little horn? Um, what does it all mean? Well, the beauty of Daniel chapter 7 and a lot of apocalyptic literature is that we're not left to guess what this means. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 17 and 18 paint a very clear picture of what is going on. So here's the clear picture for us in verse 17 and 18. So Daniel in his vision is obviously very curious. What does all this mean? So he nudges a messenger. It's possibly an angel that's revealing uh, the, these details to him or the interpretation, and it goes like this. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. So here's the picture. The four beasts, including the horns that were a part of that four beasts, and that one little horn, all represent four kings of four different kingdoms. Now, there are a lot of details there that we don't understand, but the messenger says, this is the picture. Each beast represents a different kingdom. And not only, but the broader picture is, is that there's going to be a time when there's going to be a brand new kingdom with a new king, and the saints, or God's people, are going to reign in that kingdom forever and ever and ever and ever. And so you see this picture of four earthly kingdoms and one heavenly kingdom that then reigns forever and ever. That's the picture, and that's the interpretation. So here's the temptation. Here's the temptation. The temptation for us is to lose sight of that puzzle box image that's supposed to be our guide along the way. That apocalyptic image that's supposed to guide and shape our thinking uh, and how we perceive the world. And we can get tempted to get bogged down into the details. Now, what are the details we want to know? Uh, we want to know two things primarily. We want to know the when and we want to know the who. Uh, we want to know... When is that little horn going to do all that he does? Daniel chapter 7 even gets uh, into those kind of details. I mean, Daniel wanted to know who the little horn was and what his kingdom was all about and what he was going to do. And, and Daniel chapter 7, the messenger does give us some more details. We, we know that that, that little horn is going to make a lot of great boasts and is going to overcome all the other earthly kingdoms, going to break them into pieces. And we also know that this little horn is going to defy God and is going to persecute the, the holy ones of God, the saints of God, or in our case, the church. But we don't know the when and the who. We don't know when that's going to happen. There are some scholars who say it's already happened, but we don't know the when and we don't know who, but we're desperate to know those things. And the temptation is, is to get so bogged down into the when and the who and speculating and observing all of human history to figure that out, that we miss the whole picture altogether and its purpose for us. It's purpose for us. So we can't let that happen. I don't think knowing the details is the point in these pictures. In fact, I'm pretty confident knowing the details is not the point. But as we look at those four beasts, four kingdoms of earth, each one more terrifying than the one before, there is one picture that we can paint that really depicts clearly the nature of these four beasts that I think I want us to walk away with. And that is this. We might not know the when and the who, 
But we can be certain of one thing, that the trajectory of every kingdom of men and women on this planet is headed in the same destination. Every kingdom, each one worse than the one before it, or all of them worse at the same time, are self-exalting, embracing man-centeredness, arrogant, uh, defying God, uh, pointing to themselves and their own accomplishments, uh, seeking to uh, jockey for position on the global scale of who's going to be greater than the other kingdom. Every kingdom is headed to the same destination. And every kingdom is going to be worthy of God's judgment and justice brought against them. So just remember that. We can be certain that it doesn't matter the form of government. It doesn't matter who's in charge. It doesn't matter the philosophy or the particular regime. All of them exalt man. All of them defy God. All of them go their own way. And they all have one singular destination. And that's judgment. And that's one of the pictures, our points of the picture, that I think God really wants us to understand as we look at those four kingdoms that really represent every kingdom on the planet, on earth. But as I mentioned, we do have two other scenes that are incredibly important um, that finish out this puzzle box uh, image, uh, this apocalyptic image for us that guides us along the way. And again, I've already read it, but in verse 18, verse 17 tells us about the four beasts representing four kings and kingdoms. But verse 18 says this, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. And so here's the question, how does that go down? How does that happen? Well, those two different heavenly scenes Help us understand how that happens. And it's pretty incredible. Incredible. So we have those two heavenly scenes, one of the Ancient of Days and one of One Like a Son of Man. So let's just start with the first one. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, it says this, As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancients of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire, a stream a fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. The Ancient of Days is not unlike the name that God gave to Moses at the burning bush when he said, I am. The Ancient of Days conveys to us a being that has had no beginning and has no end, and that's God, the great just ruler and judge of all of human history. And so we have this picture of the Ancient of Days who is about to take his seat in court to judge the kingdoms of the earth. And what does he look like? His hair is bright white, his clothes is white, which is symbolic of his righteousness and justness and purity. And then we also have this image of fire and flames surrounded by fiery wheels and fire coming out of his throne. And it's, that's a, a picture of his justice at work, purifying wickedness among the nations. And that's exactly what happens. Um, and then we have this throng of people, thousands and thousands who serve him and ten thousands and ten thousands who will stand before him. Uh, that could be a picture of the heavenly hosts or the, the church or the holy ones of God, those who have faithfully sought after him to listen to him and obey him. All are there, but he is holding court, and it says he sits and the book is open. Now, the picture of this heavenly scene is that the Ancient of Days is about to bring judgment against the four wicked kingdoms, especially that little horn who's thought so much about himself, who defied God. The Ancient of Days is going to bring justice against them, and he does. It doesn't stop there. Uh, in verses 13 through 14, we also have this scene, heavenly scene of one like a son of man. These are these verses. Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. 
And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So here's the picture. The heavenly scene is the Ancient of Days has just brought judgment against these wicked kingdoms, the kingdoms of men who are all headed in the same direction. They're wicked. They come out of a turbulent sea of man's sinfulness and human brokenness. And God is going to bring judgment against them, and He does. And once He does, He says, now I'm about to usher in my kingdom. I'm going to bring in my kingdom, and I'm going to hand over my kingdom to one who is like a son of man. That's what Daniel sees. He sees this man in human form where the Ancient of Days gives him the keys to the kingdom and gives the one like a son of man all authority and all dominion, and his kingdom will have no end. So that's, that's the picture, is four wicked kingdoms who seem powerful and scary, but the Ancient of Days brings judgment against them, and the Ancient of Days says, then I'm bringing in my kingdom. Here I will give dominion and authority and power like none other, to one like a son of man, and his kingdom will have no end. And that's our kingdom. It's the kingdom of God. That's the picture. The picture, that puzzle lid image, that that apocalyptic image is of God bringing justice against the kingdoms of the earth and ushering his kingdom for all time, forever and ever, where righteousness and peace and joy and gladness exists without end. But here's the question. Here's the question. Once we capture that image, and we can see that image, um, what are we to do with it? Um, What are we to do with that image? How should that image shape us? Or another way to ask that same question is, what did it matter to Daniel? And what does it matter to us? What does Daniel 7 matter to us now? How should it change how we live? Um, If we read Daniel 7, verse 28, I I think it's clearly this rattled Daniel. It says this, Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. What's clear is this vision had a very profound impact on Daniel's thinking and how he perceived the world around him. We don't know all of the impact. We know Daniel was a faithful man and longed to know God and follow God, even in the troubled times that he was in. But this vision rattled him. And I think this, these visions should rattle us in the best kind of way. So this is what I'm learning to do. I'm learning to ask particular questions that arise out of apocalyptic literature that I think should shape us. It should shape the way we think. Uh, It should shape the way we live now in the present. And it should shape the things that we desire and long for. So let me just share those three questions for you that I'm asking myself more and more, and hopefully you can ask yourself even now. So here's the first question. Um, Do I know God and His kingdom? Do I see the picture that God has laid out before me? Or am I stuck in the chaos and turbulence? Am I stuck in uncertainty? Am I always just wringing my hands saying, Lord, what in the world are you doing? What's going on? It just feels like chaos and uncertainty and hopelessness all the time. And those aren't necessarily bad questions. But the Word of God says, Uh, Paul wrote in in Romans chapter 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If God has revealed to us these kind of images that declare what kind of God he is and what he's doing, then those images, Daniel chapter 7, should shape how we view these uncertain and sometimes seemingly hopeless days, right? They should inform all the jumbled puzzle pieces around us. And so, do you know God and what He's doing? 
Do you know God and His kingdom? Do you have that kind of worldview that has been shaped by what God has revealed to us and to you? Listen, God has gone out of His way to tell us who He is and what He's done. He wants you to see. Uh, He wants you to know what he's doing. That's why he gives us uh, Daniel chapter 7 or uh, all of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and Revelation. He wants us to know what he's doing and where he has said it. Listen, when Jesus was with his disciples, he said something pretty profound. At some point in their ministry, he sat them down and said, listen, I want you to know that I don't think of you as slaves any longer but as friends. You want to know why you're friends? It's because you know what I'm doing. You know what I'm doing. I've told you what I'm about. I've told you where I'm headed. I've told you what I'm doing. And that's the heartbeat of God to his church, to to us who seek to know him and follow him. He says, I've told you what I am and what I'm about. I've given you my word. It's clear in all of creation. So do you know him? Do you see the big picture and do you believe it? But that's not the only question. We also ask a second question. Um, am I living for God's kingdom now? God has shown me his kingdom. He's shown me what he's about. He's shown me where he is headed, even though I feel like I'm in a mix of jumbled puzzle pieces and it feels uncertain. I know where he's headed. Am I living for that kingdom now? And Maybe that's a more profound question for us because it moves from just what we know to what we're doing and being. And that is so important for us. Big picture of God's kingdom are always intended to become very personal for us in that those pictures ask that kind of question. How will you live? How will you live now right in the present? Will you live like citizens of the kingdom of God or will you like live like citizens of four beasts or the kingdoms of the earth? Which will you choose? Which will you choose? How will you be shaped? How would the images of God's kingdom shape how you live now? In the New Testament, when Jesus begins talking about what the end of days is going to look like, there's one point that he makes over and over and over again. He asks this, If you go to Matthew chapters 23 and 24, you see this repeated over and over again in one way or another. But he asks this, are you ready? If the kingdom of God were to come today, if Jesus were were to return today, if he were to walk in your living room right now, are you ready? Are you ready? Have you sought to bear much fruit in the kingdom of God? Or... Have you been living for another kingdom or your own kingdom? So that's a very profound question for us. We may know the kingdom, but are we living for the kingdom of God now in the present? A very telling telling event happens with Jesus near uh, the end of his days before the crucifixion. Uh, He cleanses the temple, and then he walks outside of the city, and he goes to a fig tree, and the fig tree doesn't have any fruit on it, and he curses the fig tree and says, don't ever bear fruit again. Uh, Jesus was very frustrated of the, the fruitlessness of that tree, but not just the fruitlessness of that tree, but the fruitlessness of the Pharisees. The Pharisees knew all about the kingdom of God. Uh, they loved the law of God, but they had no fruit of righteousness. They had no fruit of righteousness. They lived in arrogance and pride and heaped burdens upon people. They didn't serve people. They didn't love God and love people the way that their law had commanded them to. They had turned everything around. And so Jesus, in his frustration against their fruitlessness, that they weren't living for God's kingdom now, even though they knew about God's kingdom, he cursed the fig tree. And that's very telling for us, is that God longs for us not just to know about his kingdom, but to live for his kingdom right now. And the last question that I would ask is this. Am I longing for God's kingdom to come? So notice the pattern that I've already alluded to. When we see the image that God wants to see of what, who he is and what he's doing, it begins to shape the way we think. It begins to shape the way we live, who we're becoming. And that's a very important question, not just what we're doing, but who we're becoming, the kind of citizens we're becoming. 
Um, but the last question is this, am I longing for God's kingdom? That's a question of the heart. What are the things that I'm longing for? We see this kind of sentiment or desire pattern for Jesus, for, for us in Jesus' prayer. Remember, when the disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray, he said this, our Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And... Um, that's a profound and powerful question for us to ask ourselves. Um, Do we have that kind of longing? Are we praying those kind of prayers? Um, Longing for God's kingdom to come. Are we aching for God's kingdom to come? I think the, the thief on the cross captures this longing better than anyone. In Luke chapter 23, verse 42, the thief on the cross says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, bear in mind, the kingdom, the thief is on the cross, he's about to die. Jesus is on the cross, he's about to die. So there's something in his mind that he knew about Jesus, whether from his teaching before of hearing about Jesus' life or how he was responding to his enemies on the cross. But his mind had been shaped. He had a certain worldview related to who Jesus was. He was the one like the Son of Man, right, who's going to be given the kingdom of heaven, given all authority. Somehow this thief on the cross knew it, and yet they were both about to die. They are both about to die. And he knew that Jesus' death and his death was not the end of what the Messiah or what Jesus was going to be doing in his kingdom. Uh, He knew that his suffering in the moment or the events in the moment did not define who he would be in God's kingdom. God was still doing something else and he knew it and he knew it and he longed for it. So it went from his knowledge that this death is not Jesus' end, this death is not my end, but if Jesus is the Messiah, he's going to be doing something to make everything right and he's going to bring in his kingdom As the Son of Man, the Son of God, who's been been given dominion and power and authority, he's going to be doing something then. And so the longing came out of this, this thief's mouth, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Longing. Do you long for God's kingdom to come? Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, Some of you are facing suffering right now, even before the pandemic. You knew what hurt felt like. You saw suffering around you. When we look at our world, we see suffering and pain and sorrow. All of those things should prompt us to long for the coming kingdom of God. Lord, make things right. Bring healing. Restore justice and peace. Get us out of this chaos and bring us into joy and gladness, security. You should long for the kingdom of God to come. And so those are the three questions that I'm asking myself. Do I know God's kingdom? Is it shaping how I think about the world and interpret the world around me? Is is knowing God's kingdom, having that image of what God is doing in Daniel 7, changing how I live now? Am I living for God's kingdom or another kingdom? And am I longing for the kingdom of God to come? Is my desire for God's kingdom to come in my life? I hope that, I hope you can ask yourself those questions, and I hope those questions can help you along the way. Odds are, like me, you can feel like that puzzle piece in the midst of a jumbled pile of other puzzle pieces. But I'm grateful for Daniel chapter 7 and other images that God wants to give us so it can shape who we are and how we ought to live until Jesus returns. Um, We do want you to respond. I know we're not in the room together. We do want you to respond. So how in the world can you respond to what God is speaking to you through his word right now? Well, we ask you to let us know. If you're on Facebook, let us know through the chat feature or post a comment Um, But we want to know what God is doing. You can email us. You can call us. You can also go back 
uh, to the link that we provided. It's on the screen now, and you can fill out that Connect Here card and let us know, hey, this is how God is shaping me. This is how I need to respond. Maybe you're coming to faith in Jesus for the first time. You want to put your faith in one like a son of man, the incarnate son of God, who died for your sin and rose from the grave, and who will usher in his kingdom and all of its fullness, bringing justice and joy. Maybe you want to put your faith in him. We want to know those things. Maybe you want to be baptized because of your faith in Jesus. You've never done that before. Maybe you want to be a part of this church family. Will you let us know? Use the chat feature, post in the comments, give us a call, an email, and certainly go to the Connect Here link provided on your screen. We're delighted that we were able to worship with you today. May you be blessed. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy and your word. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you call us friends and that you, wanna, you want us to know what you're doing. You want, us to, you want us to know what you're doing in all of human history. And Lord, even though we don't know the details, uh, we can know that you're good and you will triumph over wickedness and injustice and your son will reign forever and ever, ever when he ushers in a new kingdom. Lord, help us to live for his kingdom now and long for it to come. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen.
with thorns is crowned with glory now the savior knelt to wash our feet now at his feet
Another way that you can respond to our time of worship together is uh, going to this link and letting us know what God is doing. So click on that link. Let us know how you're choosing to respond to today's time of worship. Um, Now, as we wrap up our worship together, we typically ask two very important questions. The first is, who are you doing life with? This is so important, especially in this time when doing life with someone looks so different. Let me encourage you to make uh, calls. We call these corona calls. Just to check in on people. How are they doing? This is people that you have close relationships with, maybe in your Bible study group or small group. Uh, or in your school communities or work community, whatever. Um, But also call those people that you don't regularly stay in contact with, uh, especially those people that might be alone. Um, Pick up a phone, give them a corona call. Also, speaking of Bible study and small groups, many of you are staying really connected with that. That's awesome. But some of you might not have a Bible study group or a small group, but you really would love to be a part of something like that, especially during this time. You've recognized, gosh, I really need... Community. If you're interested in something like that, please place a comment uh, on our Facebook page or send us a private message or send me an email at danny at fbcsa.org. We want to help you connect with other people, but stay connected. It's so important for us to stay connected during this time. The last uh, question is, um, where are you serving Uh, especially in this time. Uh, How are you serving? Just because many of us have to stay at home doesn't mean we're not serving other people around us. Let me encourage you um, to find a way to connect with your immediate neighbors, whether it's an apartment building or in a community. Figure out a way to communicate and identify needs in your own neighborhood. But also here in our church family, we've taken it on and feel like we're responsible for meeting the needs of our neighbors, especially those who are losing jobs or having a hard time putting food on the table during this time. And so Community Missions, which you're a part of, is collecting uh, some basic food items, and you can discover those on our Community Missions webpage. Um, And you can collect those items. You can email us at communitymissions at fbcsa.org. We'll tell you how to drop them off or how to get them here. But we're taking those items, putting them in boxes, and taking them to families. Many of you have already done that. Continue to do that. We need to love on our community um, right around us. So please keep that on your radar. Continue to serve. We're called to be his people. And um, man, what a good thing that we... Uh, with the resources that we have, can bless our neighbors, our friends, and our family. Please continue to serve. Please continue to stay connected. All right, we're going to end this the same way we always do. So if you wouldn't mind just standing where you are, right there in your living room, uh, we are going to do our benediction, which is Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 18. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Amen. You guys have a wonderful day week. Remember to stay connected and bless those around you.